We're going live. And we are live. Mm hmm. Hello, Professor Carroll. Hello, good good day, <laughs> depending, or good evening in some cases. That's right. Well, we want to thank everybody who's joined us right now and let everybody know that these sessions will be up on YouTube. Go to Professor Carroll's YouTube page and watch them, share them with your friends. This is part of the uh, sacred music course on Professor Carroll. Dot com early sacred music but it is something that anyone can watch and anyone can can enjoy as well so we are talking about today we're talking about the Roman Empire correct the latter part of it or, or the part that concerns early Christianity absolutely we can't take the whole thousand years on although in a way you do have to think about it at all times because the part that concerns early Christianity is a very interesting time within that long stretch of Roman domination. Yes. Well, we're not going to be able to talk about like the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, I'm sure, no. on one 30-minute webcast. But yes, in regards to uh, early sacred music, there there's a lot of richness to be discovered there. And thank you for discovering it for us and bringing it to us through this class. Oh, yeah. uh, well, it's been an adventure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got videos there where, where you were, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, you, you were there, and, uh, and and some great video that that your videographer husband has done. You give him, give him, you know, give him a, a, a raise when you see him. I just give him a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> he got yeah. a raise. Well, tell me about... He can uh, have as many burritos as he wants. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah well, let's get to it. Yeah. Well, you know, now you, you just about got me talking about food, so we better get to talking about uh, this or else I'll get sidetracked. Uh, we're talking about Isidore of Seville, okay? In the early 7th century, she wrote, she. He? I'm so sorry. He. he yeah. is. But you know, you know the first time know. I encountered that name? Yeah. No, the first time I encountered that name, I was in a graduate bibliography course, and Isidore is important um, because within uh, his incredible amount of writing, he created sort of the model for the uh, one of the not the earliest model for encyclopedias, but but he, and and I remember very clearly on the first grad musicology course saying she, and getting that. <laughs> right through the you know because my professor was not amused that I didn't know that. Oh, hey, yeah. Well. It, did you just? Are we okay? I think are we still good. on? Yeah, we should yeah. be. Because I just got a different screen up, huh. and I'm not sure why. No, I'm I'm, uh, I'm hearing you and seeing you fine. I'm just, okay. Well, I won't touch anything. I no longer see you, but I won't touch a thing. Because if it's still good, then I'm good. All right. Okay. So keep going. All right. Well, anyway, my my fault there. Thank you for for ma helping me feel better about that. But yes, um. <laughs> Quote, the quote by Isidore of Seville, he is, unless sounds are held in the memory of men, they perish since they cannot be written down. Tell me about that. See, I, lo I love that. I love that quote because, it again, the theme, we've already had it in several of our sessions, uh, and we'll continue to keep it, really, through the duration of this course, which is that oral tradition was considered the optimal way to have knowledge. In this case, the knowledge of musical, music, people's speeches, musical, um, you know, in this case, music, etc. That that if you can't keep it in one generation's understanding and memory and ear, and then pass it on, you'll lose it, because you can't write down the subtleties of sound, and even of language. And, and that's just so counterintuitive to the way we are today, you know, with everything having to be written down and uh, although, yeah, I mean, now we take pictures with our phones to make sure we remember the simplest thing, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, there's an address. I don't think I want to remember that. I think I'll take a picture with my phone. I've started doing that. My wow. daughter got me doing that. But, you know, if the, the, real, the understanding of how good people's memories were, I don't think we have that anymore. Yeah, it's almost like it's hard to quote people anymore. You know, so and so said to me this, something like this. You know, and I was I was actually contemplating that driving the other day and how you know I used to could quote 
what people said. You know, somebody told me a, a, a story. I could quote that thing, but now uh, I have to rely on the, the memory of my daughters because they're better than me. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're yeah. right. I have to write it down or take a picture or record it with my with my iPhone. That's a good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So when we when we we started transitioning into that, didn't we? Into no. Yeah, I mean, sounds. and we'll be talking. We'll pick up. In fact, it's not next class, but the one after that, we have an, in our assignment a really a good exercise of beginning to look at manuscripts and codexes. But it won't be hard. I promise. It's very doable. Very interesting. So many resources are available on uh, internet now that are so interactive. You know, things that you could never touch in a rare book collection. You can now click on and highlight and have a pop-up explanation of what the cryptography or you know the handwriting will look like. The paleographic aids to understanding these things that would have been just something you'd have seen in a showcase before. You know, so uh, I'm excited about that. That's still a little bit ahead of where we are now with this hangout, but. Um, the written manuscript is really going to become the the center of everyone's focus, but but we don't. I mean, they were manuscripts are written, but we don't have them from that period, you know. And it's still, even by Isidore's time, very important to understand that they were relying on the transmission of oral tradition. It's it's just I just never want to lose sight of that in this course. Okay, well, well, first before we get into uh, liturgy, I want to. Um touch on the destruction of the temple there. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the spin that the, you say, the spin that the Romans put on this, okay? Tell us what you mean by that. Well, you know, that, it's, again, that's another topic. I don't know what everybody's experience is, but you learn a little bit in school. You learn a little bit in Sunday school. And I know, Paul, you're very, very much a student of history, so you, you've read a lot about this. But, you know, I didn't, you talk about the destruction of the temple. We talked about the early one in the BC period, but this thing that happened starting in 70, and then the subsequent wars all the way through 135. The you know, the, the, but the really massive destruction of the temple in 70, and what it meant, and and this was not a typical Roman way of handling a cultural problem. You know, the Romans were very famous for their toleration. That as long as you didn't you know mess anything up, they were doing as long as you kept an orderly life, a structured life they were perfectly happy to let you worship you know as you wanted do what you wanted keep your languages whatever as long as it didn't threaten them but the you know the Jews were monotheists you know and and that wasn't going to work out with the Romans and there's all kinds of other things there's a wonderful book called Rome and Jerusalem and now I'm going to hesitate trying to get the author that I read a, I guess a year or so ago and it went step by step through the political you know missteps because you know it's always missteps before things start blowing up there's one diplomatic misstep after another always you know when you think about it um, and suddenly this massively uh, atypical Roman event to go in there and destroy that temple and then later uh, they will be the complete destruction of Jerusalem and the you know massacres of, of so many people and the expulsion of the Jews. This is not how the Roman Empire proceeded or wanted to be perceived. So what I meant by the spin on that is they had to figure out in 70 how to present that as this magnificent accomplishment that really needed to be done. And you know that's why among other things that Arch of Titus that is built that shows the uh, very glorious procession of all the you know the military procession and spoils of war and it's made into this monumental almost godlike in terms of classical mythology um, achievement almost like it's an achievement of the gods of the Roman gods and and the big parades and the pageants and in this book it's so interesting they they talk about the floats they had something like I think there was 70 or 60 floats that were two and three stories high and they were playing out parts of the uh, of the battle and parts of the, the the victory and and I mean it's almost like a big Mardi Gras parade you know that the Romans had to make everyone see this as positive when it was a horrible counterintuitive thing oh that's a lot to say but Later on, what's interesting, as you know, is that when the the warring comes back up in the teens in the first in the second century, and then in 133, 134, 135, with the massive massacres and destruction, there there was no way to put a parade on for that. You know, that's like uh oh, <laughs> you know, things. I mean, so I just think the psychology of these two ancient civilizations, Rome and Jerusalem, these two 
civilization that's so much in common, had shared so much common ground, so much common geography, you know, they were in peace and then they weren't. And I just think it's a fascinating dynamic. Okay, yeah, so you're, you're basically talking about you, you've got your people that are in charge in, as Rome is an imperial nation at that time, the, you've got the people in charge of Jerusalem, how they're reporting that back to their boss, so to speak. Is that a way of... Yeah, well, and, it? yeah, and what's interesting there is, is uh, Josephus, the, who was a Jew who you know, became a Roman citizen and was imprisoned, and he's really, you know, I don't know how many pages he actually wrote down, but he's our one really detailed eyewitness, and you can read every word he wrote. It'd be as if you had only one witness to World War II, for example. Right? Uh, think about that. What if only one document survived? There's no films. There's no. There's no. You know. There's no photographs. There's no anything. You have one person's account. Think of that. How interesting it would be if you had to reconstruct everything. I mean, there's other information, but um, it and it is a detailed record that really tells us. You know, tit for tat, as they say, of of this and that. But from his perspective, as a Jew who was captured, who became a Roman citizen, um, and so there's a lot of mixed emotions there. Good point, good point, thank you. Well, okay, well, we're going to go to liturgy, and, you know, that's a concept that uh, some of us who grew up in the Christian church may have grown an aversion to that term, so to speak, but mm -hmm. it's really, uh, it really is broad. I mean, it, it goes back, you know, as far back as this course goes and even before, but Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Why do you think, you know, it's become that way? And but there are some who are still preserving liturgy is, you know, as it was back in this time period. Well, I I didn't grow up with the term liturgy. I never heard the term liturgy growing up. Um, which I would grew up. Uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran, most of my upbringing, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I know this is terrible to say, but you know when you're a kid, you don't really always know what's going on. I mean, I know I went to catechism. You know, I had no idea, and I, don't ha I can't even begin to tell you what we did, although when I think back about it, I remember a lot of responses, psalms that we sang. Uh, and that's about what I remember from a lot of it. Sorry, parents, you know, we do all this to make sure our kids know exactly what's going on. <laughs> they yeah. don't always remember. When we grow up, we think, well, see, I remember that lady that had the red dress that played the organ, you know. <laughs> but at any rate, I really didn't understand what the word means. And, of course, we talk about this in the class session, litos and ergon. It means really the two roots in Greek, public work or public service, ergon. So if you think about that it's a divine service of the people, people coming together to serve. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean, you know, serving uh, at the soup kitchen, although in a way that's an extension of liturgy, if you think about it. Uh, but it means to serve God through prayer and thanksgiving and it means to do it in a structured form it doesn't have to be but that's what develops out of Judaism as you well know uh, I know you've studied temple worship very uh, thoroughly and, and we've talked about that in the course um, and, and if you really see that the understanding of praising God was in terms of coming together to sing psalms and have prayers communally um, that was the way not just of oh, it's 2 o'clock, I better run over, to, or noon, I better run over to prayers. But th this was why it was noon. See, that's the thing. In our next class, Paul, we, we, we were talking a lot, we'll be talking a lot about well, the roots of monasticism and the daily offices, the eight daily prayer services that mark the, the day in early Christianity and to this day in monastic traditions. And I think it's te terribly important, it's hard, oh, I think it's very hard to realize this was not an interruption to the day, this was the day. You know, this is why you were alive, was to pray and to praise and to sing psalms and to be together in prayer. And and that's what liturgy is in the Western tradition, the Western Christian tradition, you know, and the Eastern too, although they use the term a little differently. And, and that's not how I grew up understanding it, and I don't think that's how a lot of people from a Protestant tradition necessarily understand it. I don't know. I don't want to go too deep into that. What do you think? No, I, I agree, it's at least in my experience, you know, it was sort of given a bad rap, uh, maybe that, you know, there was no feeling in it, but really as I... I got older and I started realizing there you have, you know, you go back, like you said, in the Jewish tradition and the Messianic Jewish tradition, you have a Siddur and you have catechism in many, many uh, 
denominations of Christianity, and you have liturgy of all types. As, as a matter of fact, I mean, you can go back to when the Savior said to his disciples and said, pray in this way. And he, then he proceeded to say an exact prayer as an example. And so that's, as I've gotten older, I see it as a backbone that's been very helpful. As I look into some of the Siddur's and read the prayers that uh, that they pray, they're 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 just genius, you know. And it it gives, especially for a new convert who would come in and say, "I don't even know um, this God." Well, here's here's a liturgy, mm -hmm. and here's the prayer book, and they can look and and have this backbone of the type of prayers that that one can pray. So I think you know, in most cases, they're beautiful. Yeah, they are, and of course that leads us to the Psalms, you know, because they are the background of the offices. I don't want to get into next week's material too much, but we're going to see where they are the backbone as they were in the temple times, and they are in early Christian times, and again to this day, if if you're following the eight hours or the eight offices of prayer, but the Psalms, you know, I, I again, and I don't know about your background, I, I grew up thinking that they were that little skinnier thing in the reading. <laughs> I'm not even telling all my stories today, but you know, when you're a kid, you have the, the I don't think we had all those printed bulletins, maybe we did, uh, but you know, now you have so much more that people put in your hands, but I always thought the psalm was kind of cool because it was like poetry and short, you know, <laughs> and I didn't have any idea that the psalms are, you know, the meat, bread, potatoes, you know, of of the faith, um, and and consequently, they got an enormous amount of focus. And and how they were sung was important too. Yes. Well, how? What? What do you mean by how they were sung? Well, I mean they. You know, of course, they can be read, but things were cantillated or chanted up through very recent times, and still are in in many traditions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you could have someone simply cantillate or, or liturgically intone or uh, textually put sort of a melodic structure to the to the psalm, but you have so many other ways that they could be done. They could be done in ways that we tend to call responsorial, so that some a presenter, a presenter as it would be called, but someone stands up and reads, you know, the first part and or the first verse, and then there would be a response, and it could be Alleluia, it could be um, any single word, it could be praise to God, it could be something from the psalm verse itself, and if you look at some of the psalms, and I'm sure you've probably looked at this, some of our, I know many of our people have looked at how the psalms can be grouped in terms of types of structure, and many of them are really already kind of blasting out with a little response, it's right in there, so you have that kind, and then ultimately what will happen, that will be so important in early Christianity, ultimately, it's takes a while, is antiphonal singing, where one half of that psalmic verse is sung by the people on the left, you know, and the other half is by the people on the right, back and forth, or they can do it verse by verse, but it's very often, you know, those semicolons, those great old semicolons, you know, and the power of antiphonal singing, antiphon, against the sound, back and forth, is that power is, um, again, it's very outside of our modern sense where we have all this high stimulus, you know, but it's, um, if you get to into a monastic setting, and I hope everybody can at least once experience that, um, and go, uh, you know, and you hear the psalms in the offices, and there's a lot of them sung, back and forth, back and forth, mm -hmm. whether in English or in Latin, whatever, you know, it's it's uh, do them in Hebrew. I don't care. You know, <laughs> it's just very very powerful. Wow. Well, what about you? Talk about baptism. I generally don't think of liturgy regarding baptism. But what do you mean when you talk about liturgy in baptism? Well, and there again, it depends on our traditions. You know, we have all these issues that we're we're not here to sort through doctrine, and and that's not our role in this, but, um, you know, you can go to traditions, I've been, uh, as an organist, I've played for just about every denomination, I, I shouldn't say just about everyone, but a lot, mm -hmm. and you can be in a situation where baptism can last, you know, and be a lovely baptism, but be eight minutes, you know, right, or you can it, be in a situation where baptism is a little more serious in terms of length of time, not in terms of what's happening, but in terms of length of time, of amount of text that's read, 
whether a hymn is added, etc. But we go back to early Christianity. A bap the baptism was the main liturgy. Think about this. Obviously, communion is critical, but we've got to have everybody get baptized. And there's a whole cycle of when baptism were done, you know, and what time of the year, preparation for, you know, uh, would there be Holy Saturday baptisms, on and on, and when would we do this, and the actual texts and songs and psalms that would be sung. And, you know, I don't know how whether you have Paul or if any others have been, or we may have people who are Eastern Christian, Eastern Orthodox. The first time I went to an Eastern Orthodox baptism, I had no idea. Um, and I can't tell you, it was just a completely, it would be a full service in a lot of traditions, you know. And it started with the exorcism before you actually even enter into the church. That, I forget how how long that lasted, beautiful texts, but you know, this was serious stuff being baptized. This was not picture opportunity, you know, and I'm not, again, trying to imply anything. It's just that we, from the, the textual standpoint, we don't go through all those prayers and readings and singings and statements to get into the church, you know, right. to, to then proceed to the points of baptism and Christmas. I mean, that takes a long time, and that liturgy had to develop, and it had to be sort of eventually agree agreed upon. It was very solemn, very serious, and the key to bringing people into Christianity. And so, you know, and you needed to get it right, which of course meant different things at different places, but ultimately you have a coherent liturgy, a coherent structure of how you do this thing, and, and it's very powerful. I've, this was all new to me at one point. It really, really was. It almost took studying Eastern Orthodoxy before any of this made sense to me. I don't know why. I just, you know. Well, it's it's rich, and of course, it's not as popular around here. So not many of us have grown up with it. So right. You know. Um, well, talk about Constantine's conversion experience and the importance that had during that period, and and for our music and liturgy. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't that crazy, that whole Constantine story? Of course, he doesn't get baptized. It's very common to be baptized at the end of your life. Of course, you don't always know when that's going to be, do you, especially as a warrior. Um, but, you know, there was a sense that, and again, I, it, a lot of it depends on how you read the early sources, but uh, a sense that you waited to, <laughs> if you got baptized, you couldn't sin again, you know, which, of course, we know is not true. <laughs> any rate, but there was that sense that you would be baptized, so didn't it make sense to do it sort of, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes before you're out of here, you know, or something from a, a warrior standpoint or Constantine, but he was baptized, but he didn't, you know, he had already, uh, the Edict of Milan had happened, he had already in, you know, tolerated, you know, then allowed Christianity to begin to come out from persecution, etc., um, but all of his conversion, not all of it, I mean, he he had his mother, you know, here's, you gotta love it, don't you gotta love it, his mother Helena, you know, she was the influence on this, but he didn't actually get the message until he had that vision before uh, the battle, you know, and, and I imagine all, everybody studied the history, we talk about it in the class, um, where he sees the sign, the Cairo, and he's, you know, he, he sees the guidance of Christ, and he puts that symbol on their shields, and they go off to do this battle that they were outnumbered, you know, and they win. And boy, he got that point, didn't he? <laughs> um, you know, that is what it took to impress Constantine. And, you know, somebody else might have done it. Who knows? But boy, that was a game changer. Yeah. Um, so you say Helena's role is more important? Well, I think so because, well, of course, you know, it's very often that they're put together, especially if you look at icons. Uh, I know across from the church that we used to attend in Dallas before we moved out the country, there was an uh, Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Christian church that was Helena and Constantine. Uh, but so they're often grouped together in icons. I love that, you know, mom and son, you know. She <laughs> she had the spiritual guidance and he, he did the deed and had the power to do it, if you think about it that way. But what's interesting to me about Helena is that she was such a, an activist and you have to wonder you know I don't know what the role was like I don't know what her court was like I don't know what her resources were like but she goes to Jerusalem and she um, finds the early sites where Christ's of the events in the crucifixion etc had happened and she marked them and that's why although there's still some dispute about some of this you know but uh, you know she got there and said to the people, some people that still, um, obviously they, they didn't remember, those people were long gone, but this stuff get passed down, remember. And then the Romans had tried to keep these sites from being holy, like they 
put a parking lot over them. They didn't put a parking lot over them, but they'd mark them. They put pagan buildings. They built a tennis court. It wasn't a tennis court, but you know, it'd be like building a tennis court in a parking lot over someplace sacred so that it can't still be sacred. Well, that marks the spot, right? And she got in there and found the place of the, you know, where Golgotha was and found where this had happened and that had happened. And then she erects this incredible, uh, the church that's over the uh, the tomb um, that that many Christians believe, again, is the exact place where Jesus was, was buried. And we had that opportunity to go there. Oh my gosh! And of course, that's a line. I don't know how wide, how broad. Let's say six, seven, eight people broad, and I don't know how long. And it it weaves sort of very gently through, and it takes a long time. Yeah. And then you're allowed to go sort of into that, you know, underneath the structure that that was built by Helen. It's now held up because there were earthquakes, you know, but somehow it's all still there. It's supported with uh, all kinds of braces. And then, of course, there's a big church built over it, right? It's just extraordinary. But, and you have, you're given like 12 seconds, you know, because there's 800 people, 1,800 people behind you, you know. And it's so amazing, the whole process. And, you know, it's so interesting. It's nobody... I mean, there's not any impatience that I observed. People are just in that line for that 12 seconds. Anyway, I don't mean to go off on that, but it was, I, I know lots of people go to Jerusalem, they have these experiences, but there's always a first time to see it, and it just knocked me out. And I'm sitting there the whole time thinking, you know, this, this is because of Helena. Yeah. <laughs> she, she got here, you know, before it was too late, and she, someone else could have, of course, but she had the authority, the power, the money to do it, and, and she did it. And we should be very grateful to her. So these are the spots that we visit today, the ones that she went and, and put the mark on, basically. A lot of them. Yeah. A lot of them. And of course, people still knew because, you know, we talk about, look, think about Civil War now. We're, we're going to be, in a few more decades, 200 years out. And okay, you say, well, we have books and we have we have uh, movies and we have documents. Well, we have photos photographs, you know, not Matthew Brady and all those wonderful photographs that we're talking about in the America, uh, America's Artistic Legacy course that actually was just, I think, right about this time uh, that we've been talking about it. But nonetheless, even if none of that existed, yeah. um, there would still be people who lived there who could take you to the very spot where Shiloh happened, right? You know, even though it was my great, 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 great grandfather passed this, been passed down to me that general such and such, right, did this, or this is where General so-and-so was shot off his horse. 300 years later, people still will know that, right? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, without, you know, it, but it's still good she got there when she did, you know, because yeah. time was, was passing. Yeah. Her research wasn't as, as thorough as it might have had to be, you know, if you or I went there and there wasn't anything marked. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, no. It, it's, <laughs> and it's just an amazing thing because on the one hand, and again, I'm sure lots of people have had this had this privilege, this opportunity, or will. Uh, I never expected that we would have it. It came to me courtesy of the work I do for the Smithsonian. My, it's actually the first time they sent me out as a speaker, uh, and I, I couldn't believe it. I still don't believe it. And that was a couple of years ago. I still don't believe it. But I remember thinking, um, you've got it. You know, there's millions of people that want to come here on a pilgrimage. You know, how do you handle all those people? with dignity and, you know, not have the whole structure wear out, the floors, you know. And, of course, it's very holy, and you, and you have everything. I don't mean to go off on travel log, but on the, you have people who are weeping and who have their whole lives dreamed, and they have their scarves on, and they are there with crucifixes or not, or with their Bibles or whatever, or with church groups, you know, with their pastor. And then, and, and then you have kind of goofy college kids who are, you know, want to get a picture and you know I mean it's it's just this mass of humanity I think Jesus would like that actually <laughs> it's so human and it's so you know it's so real it's so actual it's it anyway I'm sure a lot of people would have much grander things to say about it but I found almost looking at the energy feeling the energy of everybody who wants that eight or ten or twelve seconds that close to these spots that was almost as interesting as being there you know wow yeah, I'm I'm a people watcher myself, so I can relate. Yeah, well, you also went to Rome. Uh, can you tell us some of the stories about your trip to Rome there for building well, this course? Well, that was so helpful too because I was there uh, actually speaking, uh, but I had time to be able to. We we knew we were planning on this course. I mean, we had wanted to do this course, but when this and really, and I think some of our uh, students know this story, but it, it, 
in case you don't, um, you know, when we got this, when I got this first opportunity through Smithsonian, suddenly, I mean, we could have done it without all the footage, and no, we're not PBS, and we didn't bring our seven cameramen with us, you know, oh, wouldn't that have been nice, yeah. but we did what we could, you know, with the time we had, and it was so amazing, anyway, it was just such a blessing, I was oh, very excited, I'm still very excited about that, uh, what about but six, the point really? was that, well, what was interesting about that is we wanted to interview some people, and that's kind of, you know, you got to get all that arranged in a very short amount of time, and we were so fortunate to find Sister Margaret, and anyone who's done the unit on this course, and you've seen her already, she's in the first unit of the class, and she was in this unit, and we may have her some more, um, but she is a British nun with her doctorate in um, sacred music and studies and theology, maybe, I don't know, actually I don't know what her doctorate's in, and she has been uh, recognized, she's dame, you know, for, for her work in chant, and she was there in Rome, and still is, had been there a couple of years, not very long actually, in that particular assignment, opening a chant school in the convent there at St. Cecilia's. So, and the students running the summer chant school, it's for nuns from all over the world who are, who, who didn't grow up singing the Latin chant, which is true for a lot of, uh, I mean, Catholicism had moved so much away from this in, in some places. So, or even if you did, to get it better, to become much more fluent and um, uh, comfortable in your chant skills. So there she was, and she was she got permission from her mother superior to speak with us and to be interviewed. And so all of you who are watching her, and you've got to fall in love with her. She's just the most charming and smart woman. Uh, just I can't even get over it after all this time. And she let we were allowed to interview her, and we weren't allowed to photograph a lot. Okay, that's just simply not allowed. But we were able to speak with her. And then she and I talk about this in the class. She took us underneath to the Roman streets and we got to see the ruins of the very house where St. Cecilia was um, nearly martyred, you know, where she was suffocated. You could see, you could walk through to the areas where this and that happened exactly as history describes it. You could see the pagan uh, gods that were on the altars in the uh, excavated ruins of her home and then she, con she had converted to Christianity and of course her family was horrified and she, you know, she was far too prominent this was when Christianity was not, you know, um, was not exactly endorsed. And so, I mean, she, it, it's just there. It's all, it's all there. And it was just Hank, my husband, and it was, I was there, and Sister Margaret. Wow. This was not a time when it was open for tourism. I, I have to say, I mean, that's, you just kind of think, is this really happening? And she's chattering away as if we were just walking in the, you know, in the park, you know, it, Here's this, and here's that, and here's that, and it was all there. So that was amazing. That, who knew that, I mean, archaeologists know that. People who study church history know that. But there we were walking it. And, of course, tourists can go there. It's all elaborate staircases. You know, it's open to the public. It's pretty phenomenal. So there's a lot to see in Rome, but I tell you what, you, if you put that at the top of your list, I don't think you're going to be disappointed at all. Wow. Well, what was it about? Mars Hill that struck you. Okay, there you go. See, and that's another example. And of course, it's not hard. It's a lot easier to walk over to Mars Hill. First of all, you think it's really tall, right? Mars Hill. That's part of that thing we talked about, Paul, about the city of David being a small area. When you kind of, in my mind, I thought, oh, you know, Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> yeah. or something like that, you know. And instead, it's like this area. And I'm thinking Mars Hill's got to be a big hill. It's not a very big hill, mm -hmm. you know. We've got bigger hills than that in Bowie, Texas, and I believe me, it's flat where I live. But the realization that that's where Paul stood. See, I, I don't know. I don't know about everybody else. I don't know about you, but when you're actually in one of these places, it's really hard to grasp it. Mm -hmm. I, and, and here we've got all these tourists, you know, a lot of young people coming to Jerusalem and to Rome and to, and to Athens, too, you know, on cruises and you know, tour buses and then older people, too. And here we are picking across this hill, and this is Mars Hill. This is where he stood and proclaimed the gospel. I don't know. It it awed me. I mean, Parthenon's amazing. Acropolis is amazing. Theater of Dionysian. Very, very important stuff to see. It's all really important. Uh, but suddenly this rocky, it's, it's bigger than a bluff. I don't know what to call it. It's not a hill the way you people in the mountains think about it. It's a... It's an outcrop. It's a big outcrop. Is what it's a big outcrop, and that's where he stood and proclaimed this. I just plus 
you know, it also shows that people could project, you know, <laughs> you'd have to have a bunch of microphones and speakers today, you know, of course there's city traffic too, but there it is. I just think it's extraordinary. And again, don't, if you can go and if you don't, don't forget to go to Mars Hill. It won't even hardly be marked. I mean, you have to say, wait a minute, where's Mars Hill? You know, um, but I think it's powerful. Wow. Wow. Well, that's great. Thank you. And so, I, I mean, you. it's a good point about the, <laughs> you didn't have a microphone back then, and they would sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. the numbers that they would speak to was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, they breathe. Opera singers can do it. We talked about that in unit. One, then when you're trained to project the way a singer is who fills an entire theater without the first bit of amplification, of course. Um, you know, those people, and, and, and we talked about this already, but it's really true. They could blast your eardrum out with their ability, singers especially, to yeah. project. And, and, of course, it was a quieter world, too. But they, they, had, they had memory we didn't have, and they had projection we didn't have. Yeah. I like to think also that the Holy Spirit had something to do with that as well and, and help that voice and that well, there you go. project out there even more. Um, open those ears. Yeah, open those ears. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. Well, you talk about instruments and uh, getting to the music side of this. You know, you had a, you had a lot of instruments obviously mentioned in the Old Testament and, and in, in Jewish worship. When did we get to a point where we have some denominations or sects where they don't use instruments at all. When did we get that mm. way and, and do you have any idea why? Well, and of course that a lot of that develops after the Reformation and it develops in the 19th century too, a lot of the views. I think it's always helpful to realize that the Eastern Christian Church just in terms of the Christian movement never has used instruments, not because they're just evil or anything like that. They just, it is a completely sung tradition in the Russian, Greek, uh, Antiochian, Ethiopian, you know, Romanian, North American, etc. Eastern Christian Church. And we're going to have a full class on Eastern Christianity coming up. I can't quite remember when it is, but it's in a few, few units from now to talk about why that tradition has stayed fully vocal without instruments, singing only, and the word for that is a cappella, with the head, cappella chapel, okay, capital, if you will. So at any rate, um, but it, I think that it, there's a lot of reasons that people have um, that, that are much more modern, but when, when, as you said, the temple usage of the instruments and we talked about in class was extremely elaborate and, and why it goes away. I mean, it's really practical. Part of it's practical because once you have the d destruction of the temple, you know, uh, synagogue isn't going to pick all that up. They're not doing all those daily cycles of animal sacrifice the way the temple did. And a lot of the instruments were associated with announcing things in the temple, receiving high priest and receiving this and that and marking all the temple uh, liturgies, if you will. And so that's not happening in the diaspora, that's for sure, right, in the scattering of the Jews. And, and then I think the other thing that's very interesting to me, uh, it's not so much based on the destruction of a complex, beautifully established rituals that were in the temple practice that are taken away by the destruction of the temple, but it's the fact that the early Christians do want to separate themselves from the appearance of uh, anything that would be pagan, and that would mean Roman practices, because you know obviously the instruments were a big part of Roman uh, festivities, Roman um, parties, yes. you know everything, everything, you know procession and governmental practices and all kinds of things, and you didn't want like a, and I say this in the class session, but I will just repeat ourselves uh, if that's okay. You didn't want a vigil kept by a martyr's tomb to resemble. Um, you know, a bacchanalia <laughs> that might be done somewhere else. You, know, you, you really had to separate yourself out once Christianity could come out legally, you know, and, and you, the early Christians wanted to make it clear they were doing something different. Um, at least that's what they say. Again, we weren't there. I wasn't there, you weren't there. But it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And it's expensive. Uh -huh. And you had to have all those Levites who could play all those instruments and rehearsals and, you know, training and all that. And it just wasn't what grew up with early Christianity. Yeah. Well, I always think of bells, you know, when I mm. think of ancient uh, chapels and things. What, when did that, do you have any sense of, of when the bells became such a prominent part in that? 
Well, bells didn't go away, particularly because bells are practical. Bells tell oh. tell time, and of course we we talk about the bells with the offices because the bells were used in Roman timekeeping. You know, your workday started at six in the morning, and then uh, was over officially. Like the government offices would close at twelve. Lots of people worked longer in the marketplaces, and people keeping sheep, and you know, and uh, running the carts up and down. Of course, they worked much longer hours, as as they always do. But the official workday was was officially uh, fairly short. And but the bell would ring at nine. The bell would ring at twelve. You know, it was a way of reminding people when things happen. So bells are signaling devices um, for them, to, and, and they will be that way in the offices, and they are that way in the monastic tradition. Again, getting ahead of ourselves, but there will be an assignment uh, where we'll be focusing a little bit on monastic life. And more than one person, as I recall, will make statements about the bell. That's how you know when it's time to go to to um, Compline, the evening around 9 o'clock prayer service of the office. That's how you know what to do, our bell. So now, getting to the point where bells play tunes, you see, that's a different, that's a much later thing. Uh, but bells as signaling for time for prayer and worship or silence or contemplation, they don't go away out of the usage. They yeah. do not leave ever leave Christian the Christian tradition of which, uh, at least as far as I know, you know right. they're practical. Okay, very good. Well, we're getting ready to to wrap up, but we get some more terms each each session, and you give us the term anaconic. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the crazy ones in there, wasn't it? We've had yeah. some crazy ones. How, yeah, how is that useful? Well, you know, all these terms, I think at a certain point, it depends on, again, who who is uh, taking this course, whether, you, you know, your adults kind of enjoy terms, I think, and students, younger kids are sometimes frightened of terms. But, but it's, if you think of a term as kind of a freeze-dried version of a topic, you know, you can, if you can understand the term, then you've got the topic, and if you're comfortable with the term, like liturgy, or anaconic, being uh, opposed to or having an aversion to, which different points in Christianity there has been a turning away, especially in the West, always in the West, not in, you know, uh, from the icon image, from the use of the images. Um, you know, if you can get that term and just take some delight in it and look at the roots which generally are Greek or Latin or they go back further in languages and you know we have um, in our next our next class I, I, I can't to remember where all the assignments are but we have our historian Jacques our, our, our Flemish historian who speaks about ancient languages and he's just bubbling with joy at every root he finds and every term you know because it's it's those roots coming together you know and there we have this wonderful term and it's rooted in this concept and that con if you can make these terms be this kind of almost alive Plato kind of thing you know that's that's stretching back but having all this meaning then I think the terms are quite useful if they're just a list of scary words, then they're not very useful. And I hope people are enjoying the terms and 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 that they're working for the terms need to work for us. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I appreciate you for for bringing them up. And um, well, I'm looking forward to the next session. Really. The next yeah, me too. Frame this gets more and more fun. Yes. Well, I think that uh, that does it for today. Do I did not see if we had any questions. I apologize. Uh, it's okay. We can we can find here. them later. Yeah, we'll find them later, and we will we'll get with you. And uh, but make sure you go to professorcarol.com and share this this lesson. Go back and watch some of the other lessons, but also join the classes. There are a lot of classes on there that you can take part in. And I uh, just want to say thank you, Professor Carroll, for taking your time to, to go through this with us and help solidify these lessons in, in the class, early, uh, early sacred music. Thank you, Paul, for being part of it. I know that this is a topic so dear to your heart, and you're such a, a reader, and, and you're a good guide helping us get through this. Oh, I love it. Well, we'll see you uh, next week. Next week. Very yeah. good. All right. Bye. Bye.